Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, as with all of FAIR's webinars, this presentation will be recorded and posted on the FAIR website in about seven to ten days. Please note that for maintaining a quality recording, all of our attendees will be muted throughout the webinar. If time allows, at the end of the presentation, we will have an opportunity to take some questions. And because our attendees will be muted, we ask that you please submit these questions via our questions feature in your GoToWebinar panel, which is on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, for those of you on Twitter, we encourage you to join us in conversation during the broadcast. You can follow along with our webinar live tweets at our handle, at FoodAllergy, or the hashtag FairWebinar. Um, all of FAIR's resources and education programs, including our free webinars, are made possible through community support. If you'd like to make a tax-deductible gift or become a FAIR member to advance our mission efforts, you can do so at foodallergy.org slash donate. So at this time, I'm going to turn over to uh, Scott Riccio. Scott Riccio is responsible for the overall strategic leadership of the education and advocacy departments at Food Allergy Research and Education. He formerly held leadership and advocacy at Dendrion Leukemia Lymphoma Society and most, rec most recently Synergiva Biopharma. He holds an MBA in Entrepreneurship and Strategy from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business and as father to a daughter with a peanut and tree nut allergy. His professional experience is further enhanced by his professional connection to FAIR's mission and I get the wonderful opportunity to work with him every day here at the FAIR office and so um, I am delighted to at this point turn the presentation over to him. Wow, thanks, Lynn. Um, I appreciate the introduction and, and certainly the opportunity to work with you every day. Um, you're looking at a picture which definitely, as, as Lynn said, represents the probably most important thing you need to know, I suppose, about me, which is my personal connection to this mission. Um, she is standing to my right. I'm seated there next to my wife, and our son is there. Uh, but, but our daughter, uh, Maya, who is now 11, uh, was diagnosed with a peanut tree nut uh, allergy between her first and second birthdays. So for the past decade or so, we have been managing uh, food allergies just alongside many in this community. So appreciate all of you being with us, appreciate everyone's support, and uh, look forward to a, a good discussion. So um, one of the important things, and we, we talk about this a lot, and I think it, you know, it sort of highlights and underscores the severity of food allergies. We know that every three minutes, a food allergy reaction sends someone to the ER in the United States. Every six minutes, that reaction is anaphylaxis. For people with food allergies, particularly teens who are at highest risk for severe or fatal reactions, it can be difficult to distinguish when to use epinephrine, the first-line treatment for anaphylaxis. Heather Braverman, age 19, hadn't had an anaphylactic reaction in 16 years. In this new video from FAIR, Heather shares her story to educate teens, adults, and parents of children with food allergies. We thank Heather for sharing the lessons she learned as a result of this frightening episode, which serves as a cautionary tale. Her experience was a wake-up call to not hesitate to use epinephrine when a known allergen is ingested. In about five minutes, I'll press play and come back to you. I'm Heather Braverman. I'm 19. I'm from New Jersey, and I've had pretty much my entire life. I was diagnosed with that too. Something that was always difficult growing up was going to a birthday party and everybody had to light after saying happy birthday, and that just was never a thing for me. There's no light switch when you have food allergies. It's always it's always on. It wasn't just an eating situation. It was everywhere I turned, going to a friend's house. You just have to learn to speak up and realize that if you don't, then no one else will do it for you, and it can be a matter of life or death. The night that I was hospitalized, I think it was a Friday night, and my best friend Amanda, we had a plan. We said, you know what, let's just go out for a nice girls' dinner and see a movie. When the waiter came over, the first thing we said was, okay, first of all, please note, my friend and I, we both have very severe food allergies, so please let the chef know and make sure there's no cross-contact or anything that we order has nuts. And she said, okay, great, I uh, will make sure that's all taken care of, and it should be out in a few minutes. A few minutes later, the tuna tartar comes out. Within seconds, my stomach started hurting like it had never hurt in my life. So I texted my mom, and she said, okay, take the antihistamine medication that you have with you and call an ambulance right away. Heather was in the ambulance at the time, and I came back in. I said, Heather, don't freak out but it was peanut sauce. And when you hear that psychologically, your heart, you have starts racing and pounding because you know what that means. Five 
finally I got into a hospital room. The pain was really uncontrollable. They just gave me an IV, antihistamine, and a lot of nausea medication. And then a few minutes later, I said, you know what, I think my throat is closing. They eventually, when I said that, gave me the epinephrine. My hands were shaking. I couldn't even text my mom, but immediately all my symptoms went away. It can be tricky to distinguish when epinephrine is needed or not. Um, some of the mild symptoms in the beginning might just be an itchy mouth or some nausea, and you might not be reaching for the epinephrine for that in all cases, but if things start to progress, so it's more than just a little hive, it's more than just a little mouth itch, or more than just some stomach discomfort, you'd want to be thinking about using the epinephrine. It was really, really scary, and you don't think that it can happen to you. I didn't have a reaction since I was two years old. I was 18, 16 years of life without a reaction. After this happened, I had a really thorough conversation with Dr. Fisher. And if I had known that it was the appropriate time to use epinephrine, I would have done it in five seconds. I think it's very important to discuss with your allergist exactly what to do in case of an allergic reaction or anaphylaxis. You don't want to leave this up to assumptions. You want to make sure that you go through and rehearse different situations where you would use epinephrine, for example, and how to activate emergency services in the event of an allergic reaction. The allergist might provide a written emergency plan that describes all the details of what to do in the event of allergic symptoms or ingestion of the allergen, but it's also important to go over that verbally, have a discussion, talk about scenarios, rehearse situations, so that you feel really comfortable about when you would use the medication, what you would do in these emergency situations. It alarms me if I hear people say, oh, I'm supposed to wait until I can't breathe or I'm starting to pass out. I'm, no, you're supposed to use the epinephrine early in an allergic reaction. You want to get that medicine in when there's a time that it can get circulated to get to your lungs and, and throughout your system to really help you in an allergic reaction. My reaction was a wake-up call to everything that I thought I knew about what it meant to have a reaction. This is a wake-up call because I learned that this is the moment to use epinephrine. There's no wait time, there's no second guessing. You have to listen to your body and how you're feeling and realize this is serious and this is happening. So I need to respond to it with the necessary action. I was able to learn, okay, this is what is necessary. And it really just woke me up and shocked me, but I'm grateful that now I know what I have to do. So, I, I, we're just so grateful to Heather for sharing her story. I think you know she said a couple of important things that always stick with me. You know when I hear when I hear them, and one is that you know you have to learn to speak up for yourself. And so what we're going to talk about today is is empowering people with the knowledge to to begin to speak up for themselves. Um, but I think Heather's story is also important because we work so hard on avoidance um, because that's job one to stay safe when you have a food allergy. Avoid, avoid, avoid. And Heather reminds us that it's important to stay vigilant uh, and, and continue to train and remind and refresh on what to do in case of uh, an anaphylactic reaction. And so I think that's a, it's an important lesson there for us all. So we're excited. Uh, the, the slide here, what you can do and food allergies re react with respect. Uh, food Allergy Awareness Week begins May 8th and runs through the 14th. Um, our theme this year is React with Respect, and I think um, you have to respect the allergy, respect each other, respect our community, uh, and respect the knowledge that we need to have to be able to respond appropriately. So we're going to talk about where some of these resources are, but I think you know we highlight some of the key pieces of information on this on this uh, picture. You know, knowing that 15 million Americans have food allergies and it's a life-threatening medical condition, you can do that. You can know that. You can know the and learn the symptoms of an allergic reaction. You can learn how to use an epinephrine auto-injector and know that it's the first-line treatment for severe allergic reactions. Uh, knowing that you know, helps you because you never know when you may be able to help someone else in need. Uh, and you can certainly know that you can visit foodallergy.org to learn more. So that's the big number, 15 million or more Americans with food allergies. Um, that's you know, impacting approximately 6 million children as well, roughly one in every 13 or two in every, class, every average size classroom. 
Um, that's a big, big number. So to give you a sort of a sense of how big that number is, put it in perspective, if the food allergy community were a state, it would be the fifth largest state in the United States by population. The number of people with food allergies in the United States is greater than the entire populations of New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago combined. So that should give you some good, good perspective. And frighteningly, the numbers are getting bigger. Uh, you know, the public health ec epidemic that we talk about with food allergies. We know that from a 2013 study from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, they saw a 50% increase in food allergy among children between 1997 and 2011. 50%, that's a huge increase. Uh, we also know that more than 30% of children with a food allergy have multiple food allergies. So they not only are they becoming more prevalent, but multiple food allergies are becoming more prevalent, which adds complication, as we know, in management. So what is a food allergy from a basic you know, primer perspective? Well, we know that the role of the immune system is to protect the body from germs and disease. And a food allergy is an overreaction by the immune system to a food protein. When the food is eaten, the immune system thinks the food is harmful and releases histamine and other chemicals to attack this uh, enemy. We also know there is no cure for food allergy and that strict avoidance of problem food is the only way to prevent an allergic reaction. Common food allergens, so eight foods are responsible for the majority of food allergy reactions in the United States. Peanut, tree nut, milk, egg, wheat, soy, fish, and shellfish. But we also know that a person can be allergic to virtually any food and that all food allergies need to be taken seriously. Food intolerance versus food allergy, this is always an important thing to understand because it's important when we do education in the communities in particular to distinguish between these two. Food intolerance, so this is a reaction to a food that does not involve the immune system and is not life-threatening. An example, lactose intolerance. So that could be, that's trouble digesting lactose, the natural sugar found in milk, that can result in gas, bloating, stomach cramps, diarrhea, it can be very uncomfortable, but it's not life-threatening. Food allergy, on the other hand, is a potentially serious reaction to food that does involve the immune system and can be life-threatening. So by comparison, the example there is a milk allergy, an immune response to the milk protein. Ingestion of milk can result in hives, wheezing, low blood pressure, and potentially death. Other related conditions that we hear about and we know about and, and our community is challenged by celiac disease. Uh, also, just a note here that celiac disease or gluten intolerance is different than a wheat allergy. Uh, there's eosinophilic esophagitis, or EOE. Food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome, or FPIs and oral allergy syndrome, or OAS. And you can find out more about all of those at foodallergy.org backslash related hyphen conditions. <clears throat> the first step uh, is an important first step with suspected food allergies, uh, working towards a diagnosis. We believe that suspected food allergies should always be evaluated, diagnosed, and treated by a qualified medical professional, such as a board-certified allergist. Uh, in terms of finding an allergist, you can get obviously a referral from your primary care physician or provider. You can go to the directory. Uh, there are two professional associations, um, AAAAI or Quad AI, as we say, uh, the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, so AAAAI.org, or ACAAI.org, which is the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Both of those websites have directories where you can find an allergist near you. Um, Self-diagnosis, we know, can lead to unnecessary dietary restrictions and inadequate nutrition. It's important to know specifically what you're allergic to. <clears throat> there are diagnostic tests available for food allergy, skin prick, blood test, trial elimination diet. Uh, the gold standard, we, uh, the science tells us right now, the oral food challenge is the best uh, and most accurate method of diagnosing a food allergy. Again, the website link at the bottom, foodallergy.org backslash diagnosis hyphen and hyphen testing. Um, you can get more information as well about what's available there. Recognizing and responding to food allergy reactions. Um, Heather's um, 
story and others we, we know uh, make clear that previous reactions do not predict future reactions. This is so important to understand. How severe the reaction is and which symptoms you get can change from one reaction to the next. Take it seriously every time. It's vital to always carry epinephrine auto-injectors if you're diagnosed with the food allergies. The uh, <clears throat> current professional guidelines tell us it's important to have two auto-injectors with you at all times. In the case of severe reaction, minutes to first administration of epinephrine can make an important difference. It's important to know the possible symptoms of an allergic reaction and know how and when to use your auto-injector. The next slide has, I think this is really important, particularly with small children, uh, some language um, to help recognize and respond to food allergy reactions. So when young ones in particular, um, you know, we'll see them put their hands in their mouths or pull and scratch at their tongues if they're starting to have a reaction. Sometimes you may recognize that their voice is changing, becoming more hoarse or squeaky. They may begin to slur their words. Uh, we put together actually a document in sort of describing how children might describe their reaction. So there's a number of different things on here you'll say but or, or, or see, um, you know, this food is too spicy, my tongue is hot, there's something stuck in my throat or my tongue feels full or heavy, my lips feel tight, feels like there are bugs in there, if they're it, describing itchy ears, my throat feels thick, feels like there's a bump in the back of my tongue, etc. So at the bottom of, again, the website, foodallergy.org backslash symptoms, you can get more information there. But we think it's important, especially if you have young ones or are around young children, to just understand that they may say it differently than we do, and they may experience it, it differently and not have the words that we sort of expect from, a, from an adult perspective. So um, try to listen for that as well. The next page is a, a poster information we have in terms of the symptoms of an allergic reaction. A couple of important things, and I, I won't read all of the bullets here, but you know, you can have symptoms in the mouth. We know itchy mouth or ear canal, congestion, sneezing, trouble swallowing, etc. cetera. Uh, skin, you know, people are, are always looking for hives, but we know that anaphylaxis can occur without hives, and that's important to know as well. Um, redness of the skin, turning blue. Uh, at, in the abdomen, you know, you can certainly have nausea or vomiting, stomach pain. Uh, you heard Heather talk about her stomach pain. In the chest, you can you can be affected with drop in blood pressure, chest pain, loss of consciousness, and one that that I think you know we always try to make sure to emphasize as well is this emotional uh, symptom. You know, this sense of impending doom. We hear children to say, "I feel like something bad is about to happen." That they know it, it it's something bad is going on, uh, and it can also be a sort of a change in alertness, mood swings, things like that. So important to keep those in mind as well. Again, why? Why does it matter? The important thing to remember is that food allergies are life-threatening. I mentioned earlier a food allergy reaction sends someone to the emergency room every three minutes, resulting in 210,000 visits to the emergency room every year in the United States. 40% of children with food allergies have experienced a severe or life-threatening reaction, and food allergy is the leading cause of anaphylaxis outside the hospital setting. What is anaphylaxis? That's the severe allergic reaction. It's rapid in onset and can cause death. It's a medical emergency, and time is of the essence. As I said earlier, minutes to first administration of epinephrine in the case of anaphylaxis are critical. Uh, and studies show us that fatal reactions are associated with a delay in receiving epinephrine. So how do you treat anaphylaxis? Today, epinephrine is the only medication that can reverse the symptoms of anaphylaxis. You heard Heather talk about that a little bit in her own story. Antihistamines will not help with a severe reaction. They do not treat anaphylaxis. For severe reactions, it's important, again, and we underscore, act quickly. First thing, give epinephrine. Then call 911. Make sure that the individual is taken to the emergency room for follow-up care in case of a biphasic reaction, which is a, a second reaction which can, be, uh, which can actually occur hours later. Uh, a second dose of epinephrine may be necessary if symptoms have not subsided in five to 10 minutes. So that's a possibility as well. Keep in mind, that's why we always recommend that people have two auto-injectors with them at all times. Uh, here's just a, a graphic or a picture of the two uh, epinephrine auto-injectors that are on the market here in the US today. 
be prepared. So anyone who has been diagnosed with a food allergy and prescribed an epinephrine auto-injector should carry it with them at all times. In fact, as I mentioned, they should carry two at all times. Check to see that it hasn't expired. So look at the date. Check to make sure that it's kept at a safe temperature and that it has not been damaged. All these things need to be done regularly so that in the event of an emergency, you have an intact, unexpired, undamaged epinephrine auto-injector to help save a life. Have an emergency care plan. Keep, keep the emergency care plan in a place where others can find it. Also, medical IDs will help protect you or your loved ones wherever you may be during an emergency. Uh, the next is a graphic of the emergency care plan that's available on our website, which includes combinations of the symptoms that you may see. Again, the reminder about inject epinephrine immediately and then call 911. Uh, demonstrations on how to use the various auto injectors, et cetera. And so these things can be used in schools, workplaces, other places, uh, or left with, with caregivers as well as important reminders of what to do and how to recognize a reaction. We talked about avoidance is job one for us in the food allergy community. That means to avoid reactions, we have to read every label every time. So even though you bought something at the store and looked at the label last week or last month and you've been eating it just fine, read it again the next time before you buy it. Manufacturing locations change, ingredient lists change, recipes change, read it every time. Uh, there's a the law, <clears throat> Food Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act, we call FALCPA. That's the law um, put in place by Congress, given to the FDA, that requires that the top eight allergens be declared in plain language, which means if you see, for instance, if you have a milk allergy and there's casein or whey in the ingredient list, at the bottom in bold language, it will say contains milk, so that you know and don't have to know all of the other ways that, that your allergen may be described or appeared. Uh, as we know, obviously one of the challenges is it's only the top eight. Uh, we're working very hard right now from an advocacy perspective to try to get sesame added to that list. Uh, but again, it's just important to know what the law does and does not require. So that's where we are today. Uh, we know that I mentioned the ingredients in packaged foods can change without warning. Allergens not included under FALCPA may be listed as uncommon names. They may be hidden in ingredients. This is a challenge, again, with sesame and other, other spices. Uh, they can just be listed in a spice mix. It could say natural flavorings or spices, and you don't know what's in there. So in those cases, uh, call the manufacturer. That's your best bet. <clears throat> um, also know, and this is really critical, we see on some uh, manufactured goods, foods, these may contain uh, advisory. They're called advisory statements. And it'll say may contain traces of manufactured in a facility with, uh, manufactured on shared equipment, all of those things. None of those statements are required or regulated by law. The only thing required is if you have one of the top eight allergens as an intentionally added ingredient, that <clears throat> allergen has to be declared in plain language. That's as far as the legislation today goes. And obviously we at FAIR are working very hard to change that to improve labeling so that we as consumers can know more when we buy products in the store, but today that's all that the labeling law requires, so it's important to know that. So the fact that you don't see a may contain label on a manufactured food does not necessarily make it any safer than one, than one that says may contain, and we know people are making those decisions today, so it's important to know that's a choice made by the manufacturer uh, based on a variety of factors which may or may not be related to the risk in the product for you. Avoiding reactions. Um, it's important to note that cross-contact cross is one of the things that we worry about most in the food allergy community. Uh, it occurs when an allergen is unintentionally transferred from one food to another. It's important to know that even a tiny amount of an allergen can cause a severe and potentially life-threatening reaction. So if you think about hands as a source of cross-contact, that might be an example might be, you know, you're handling shrimp and then preparing a salad. Uh, the salad may not have shrimp in it, but if the last thing, if you've handled shrimp along the way and haven't <clears throat> thoroughly washed your hands or changed gloves, um, that can pr provide cross-contact into the salad and create a life-threatening situation, um, touching almonds and then making pasta, for instance. Utensils, cutting boards, baking sheets, pots and pans are other sources of cross-contact, and again, that could be 
using the same spatula to flip a hamburger uh, after a cheeseburger. And again, the cross contact with the milk <clears throat> allergen and the cheese. Um, slicing cheese or, uh, or making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and then cutting something else or cutting vegetables on the same cutting board. Um, preparation and cooking services, surfaces, I'm sorry. Um, you know, again, that's preparing different kinds of sandwiches on the top uh, or cooking fish and chicken on the same grill. And that's uh, a potential opportunity. Um, steam, splatter, flour dust, crumbs, those are all uh, possibilities of cross contact. We know, you know, baking flour from a pancake mix, splattering onto some bacon or the steam from cooking fish, uh, touching nearby foods, that can be a challenge from a cross contact perspective. Refrigerators, freezers, storage areas, again, the challenges of making sure that the containers that food is stored in are tight uh, and that they're cleaned regularly. So ranch dressing dipping, uh, dripping onto a vinaigrette uh, stored on a lower shelf, for instance, milk leaking onto margarine stored on the same, same shelf. Deep fryers, that's an important uh, challenge as well, cooking oils, so making French fries in a deep fryer after the chicken tenders, for instance. Uh, or reusing cooking oil to saute the green beans after you've sauteed fish, for instance. Condiments, nut butters, jelly and jam, again, you know, mentioning that dipping the knife that you use to spread peanut butter into a jelly jar, um, you know, that's a, that's a big, big common one. Uh, touching the tip of a squeezed ketchup bottle to a breaded chicken sandwich, um, all of those places can create cross-contact risk. Um, and other shortcuts, things that uh, we know are, are challenges, particularly in, in the restaurant or food service industry, you know, the the lack of awareness sometimes, you know, that picking croutons off a salad does not remove the risk or scraping eggs off a plate or, or just removing the allergen from a plate does not remove the risk because the cross contact was already there. So proper cleaning to remove allergens is critical. Wash with warm soapy water, rinse with clean water and dry with a new cloth. For each new item, use clean hands or latex free gloves utensils, surfaces, oil and water, pots, baking pans, and baking sheets. So that's very important from a good food preparation standpoint and food safety at home or uh, in a food service setting. It takes a village, absolutely. Uh, and so, you know, it's something we've certainly learned over the last decade and we're grateful to everybody who has been involved in different places to help build education, awareness, or a safer world uh, for our own daughter, but certainly for everybody in the food allergy community. So there are some resources here. These are all, I'm gonna, I'll show you the link in just a moment, but we have a what all parents can do uh, information <clears throat> uh, shareable. You, know, you can know that one in 13 children have food allergy, potentially life-threatening condition. We, you can know that the prevalence is increasing, so more kids have allergies than in the past. You can consult with a child's caregiver before handing them food because they could be allergic, so that's, it's important to ask and be as proactive as possible. Uh, don't assume that if they, if the child especially doesn't say something, uh, that <clears throat> that they're not allergic. Support other parents by asking about food allergies before sending food to the classroom, and respect school rules regarding allergies. Partners can know that food allergies cause added stress and anxiety in relationships. Uh, think before you kiss. Be willing to change your diet if necessary to keep your partner safe. Avoid blaming your partner. Be kind to each other and aim to tackle your food allergy challenges together and seek counseling from a professional when needed. What schools can do? Know that 16 to 18% of school-aged children who have food allergies have had a reaction in school. Have a plan that outlines the school's policy and procedures for managing food allergies following the CDC guidelines. Make it easy for parents to find that plan. Make sure every child at risk for anaphylaxis has an individual written accommodation plan to ensure they're safely included in all school activities. Inclusion, inclusion, inclusion. What employers can do, and this is important as well, conduct training sessions to educate employees on food allergies and how to respond in the case of emergency. The more people know, uh, you know, you could be in a situation where that person isn't able to uh, provide their own epinephrine auto injector or inject themselves because they've already <clears throat> gotten too sick or are passing out. So if the, if the team around them knows, they may be able to help recognize and save a life. When the planning team, uh, when, when, when you're planning team celebrations or outings that involve food, ask the employee with food allergies what works for them. Be understanding if the employee needs to take unexpected sick days and work with the employee to provide accommodations. 
So learn more and get involved. So you can take the React with Respect pledge. That would be terrific. Find more on Food Allergy Awareness Week. This is uh, at our website. The link is here, foodallergy.org backslash food hyphen allergy hyphen awareness hyphen week. So we got uh, paid by the hyphen here. Um, lots of good information there. Uh, get involved in the Fair Walk for Food Allergies, which are amazing events in local communities to build awareness and just a, an opportunity to see that, you know, it's not just you and there are so many others dealing with food allergies in your community. Uh, come to the Fair Conference. Our national conference is a week from this weekend in Orlando. We'd love to have you there. Teen Summit will be in November in Milwaukee this year. We'd love to have you there if you have teens as well with food allergies. Uh, attend a gala or a luncheon in the areas where those uh, take place. Get involved with fair advocacy. You know, as I said, we're working in many states to make sure that there's epinephrine available, that schools are trained, that restaurants are aware, that airlines are safer. There's lots of places, uh, and numbers matter in all of those uh, activities. So please, you know, find a way to get involved. Our teal pumpkin project, which is a you know, really a amazing project in terms of building awareness and, and respect in communities for kids with food allergies at, at what has historically been such a tough time around Halloween. Uh, it's a terrific project. Get involved there. Put your teal pumpkin out. Get on the map. Uh, have <clears throat> non-food treats available. All of those things can be just, just change, they can change a life, you know, when, when people see that, that it's not just them and the community wants to take a, take a role in helping keep them safe. It means a lot. Um, connect with or form a support group. There are amazing support group leaders all across this country. Um, you know, many of them started out just looking around and realizing that there wasn't a support group in their area, and they have done amazing, continue to do amazing good every day. Uh, be, or become a fair member, you know, and, and do any or all of those. There's just many, many ways to get involved and, and support the mission, support, um, you know, life, health, and hope for people with food allergies. We appreciate every one of you who have been involved. So. I think that concludes my slide presentation today. Um, I will turn to Lynn now, who is smiling at me, to see if we have any uh, pressing questions. But thank you all for taking the time to listen in today, uh, and, and, and thank you for getting involved and, and getting educated. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Um, and just if you're looking for a little bit of a quicker link to get to our Food Allergy Awareness Week materials, um, you can just go to foodallergyweek.org. Um, so you don't have to use quite so many hyphens. Um, <laughs> but there's a lot of really great shareables. Some of the shareables that we included, um, they only cover a small portion of the, the different populations. Um, there's information for roommates. There's information for, um, for uh, you know, in addition to, to the workplace um, employers, there's also information about coworkers. You know, we're trying really hard to make sure that we're um, addressing caregivers, so if you have a babysitter that is going to be looking after your little one, um, trying to address all of the people that may connect with, uh, with your child with food allergies, or if you're an adult, the different people that you might be interfacing with um, in, in managing food allergies. So um, we'll take this opportunity to sort of answer some of the questions that have come through. Um, if you do have questions at this point, please know that you can use the questions feature in your GoToWebinar um, portal and sort of address those um, there as well. Um, the other thing that I just want to point out too is we, we kind of covered sort of food allergy basics here and there is a lot of really in-depth information about things like diagnosis, um, managing food allergies at schools and helping schools, preschools, um, preparing for college, um, all sorts of in-depth webinars on a lot of the different topics that we've covered. Um, we've covered over the last couple of years, um, a number of different things related to the emotional issues related to food allergies and things like that. So um, if you're looking for more information on things like that, like the diagnosis, managing in different environments, managing in the workplace, um, check out our webinar archives, um, which you can access through FAIR's website. So um, with that, though, we will try to address some of the questions that have come through, which um, perhaps address some of the more in-depth information <laughs> related to some of the slides. Um, so um, one of the questions that has come through was related to when it might be appropriate for a child to carry their own epinephrine. Um, is there any sort of legal standard or is it sort of um, individually based on maturity? So Scott, having a daughter that carries epinephrine, uh, what are your insights there? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the it really is more maturity based. I mean, you know, they uh, generally what you'll see in schools is a process for school nurses to work with a child with food allergies to evaluate their uh, ability to self carry. Generally speaking, the physician will provide a a note as well that supports uh, the patient, the, the the child's need to to have their auto injectors with them. Um, and it just does become about sort of a comfort level with it um, from both your perspective as a parent and your child's perspective. You know, there's a certain time where you just realize that they're ready or need to be ready, uh, and that's important. I think, you know, we've seen some very young children who self-carry at least to have it, you know, the proximity there too. And so it may be that, um, you know, it's just it's closest to them in the event that they're having an emergency. So if they self-carry, then we know the teacher could get access to it or the bus driver or some some other uh, uh, person or parent uh, around. So not a, uh, a definitive legal age, but rather just a maturity. They're ready for it um, and they can do it. Great. Thank you. Um, we did receive a question that kind of came through about uh, food allergy reaction history and, and how that relates to different types of testing. Um, my uh, preface to this would be that any sort of questions related to diagnosis and testing and, and overall management should be uh, directed to um, your medical provider. But Scott, I don't know if you have any other in inputs on that. Um, yeah, I, my input is just to, you know, we're certainly fair is working hard and we're investing in research and new diagnostics. Um, we'd love to have a great alternative to the oral food challenges um, that had the, the obviously the specificity, the accuracy that oral food challenges do. Um, but right now we don't have it. And so, you know, we talk about skin prick tests and blood tests. Um, those are, are important pieces of tools in the process, um, but they are not definitive. You know, there are far too many, um, you know, false uh, reads out of those to, to do anything other than an oral food challenge as sort of the definitive uh, standard. Uh, and so I think that's important. It's also important to, you know, you, you think, well, if my child's already had a, a severe reaction, um, it's sometimes difficult to tease out what exactly it was that they were having the severe reaction to, given what we just talked about with cross contact and others. So the oral food challenge provides very specific information about what the food is that, that can cause that level of reaction in an in a individual. All right. Um, moving on to uh, recommendations for schools. Um, what are what are our sort of recommendations in terms of addressing allergens in the classroom and and daycares for preschool rooms? Um, so there are you know CDC guidelines. We we follow the CDC guidelines. We prefer to go with the evidence and and what the data tells us. Uh, and that basically says there are a number of different ways to address keeping kids in the classroom safer. Um, some portion of it is certainly age-based. We know that younger kids who are not as um, able to sort of, or not as likely to, you know, be consistent about washing their hands or advocating for themselves or separating themselves. And, you know, you certainly young kids kind of tend to touch everything. And so the the way you approach uh, safety in a classroom from a food allergy perspective does evolve as, as age evolves. Um, but I think our, our, our stance on it is that there are a lot of ways to do it, uh, but there are some really great, there's some really great guidance in the CDC guidelines, I think. You know, the idea of just not having food in the classroom, I think it's an important one, moving it to the cafeteria when you can, um, those sorts of things, regular hand washing, awareness, education, and inclusion are all critical aspects. Um, rather than come in and say we can't have this uh, ever because we know that there's a, there's an awful lot of uh, opportunity for challenge there. Yeah, and I think that you know every every child will be sort of individual in terms of um, that's why we sort of recommend the the individual accommodation plans. Um, you know, depending on the age, the the social needs. There's a lot of stuff that kind of goes into it. But um, if you go to foodallergy.org/cdc. Um, you'll be able to download the guidelines um, in their complete form. We've also tried to uh, help make some resources that are a little bit user friendly, so a one sheeter that includes accommodation recommendations and so on. So um, hopefully, find those helpful. And again, lots of webinars on that topic um, in our webinar archives. Um, 
This is a question that is a little bit based on research, which we uh, we can speak to to, to some degree, but um, it's about prevalence and, you know, does having one child with food allergies necessarily raise the risk for a younger sibling to be at risk? Yeah, that, I mean, that highlights the fact that we do not have a good understanding in the scientific community about what's causing this dramatic increase in food allergies. You know, I think that there is, there is certainly no specific cause has been pinpointed yet. There's general agreement in the scientific community that some combination of genetic envi and environmental factors uh, are at play here, but understanding it any more than that to tell us what increases risk, uh, you know, we're just not there yet. And so again, that's an, an area and understanding the sort of underlying biology and environment that FAIR has continued to invest in research in so that we can, we can understand the biological and environmental causes better, the triggers, so that we can determine, you know, how better to intervene earlier. Great, um, very helpful. And, and so one of the other questions that have kind of come through uh, is related to if we're in a caregiver setting and sort of administering epinephrine, what are, um, what are the recommendations there in terms of um, the ability to sort of administer? And you know, there are some, there, I think that the laws vary from state to state, but I'm wondering if you might be able to just kind of speak about Good Samaritan law, how that applies to epinephrine administration, and yeah, I mean it's, it's a great question, and I am certainly not uh, your, your legal expert, so it's important to to look at what the laws in your state provide or require or deny. Uh, but in general, our rule of thumb is that Good Samaritan is fairly protective in terms of use of epinephrine, so you're you know, you're not holding yourself out as you're not a medical professional, you're not making a diagnosis, but in cases of, of, of extremists, basically, uh, where somebody is experiencing an anaphylactic reaction, then you, you have pretty good coverage as a lay person administering epinephrine in those circumstances. One of the things that I would add is that the, the complications of administering epinephrine if it's not needed are, um, are far less than if it is not administered and, um, and epinephrine is needed in an emergency situation. That wholeheartedly agree. We know that the guidelines say there are no absolute contraindications to administering epinephrine, and far better to err on the side of administration if it's in question in those cases. But all right, um, I think that that sort of has brought us to the um, to the end of our question <laughs> and answer session. Um, so I, I thank everybody for kind of submitting their questions and and being here today as part of this. We hope that. You know, you're able to kind of share this as a resource for um, for friends, family members, loved ones, anybody that is sort of looking for a general uh, overview of food allergies. Um, of course, if there are um, other areas that you want to get into more depth in, um, we do encourage you to check out all of our resources that we have available on our website. Um, you can also uh, contact us at contactfair at foodallergy.org, and we're happy to guide you to resources if you're having a difficult time finding anything. Um, but we hope that you'll help us kind of continue to share these resources and the educational resources, the shareables, following us on Facebook and, and sharing some of our social media shares uh, to, to continue to take action for food allergies this month. Um, Scott, I don't know anything else that you want to add about. No, I, I mean, I think, I think that's it. I mean, every bit you can do to get good information out there, you know, that's our, that's our focus as an organization to look at what the evidence and the science tells us and make sure that we're doing everything we can to make sure that all the information that people need is available to them as a national resource provider, uh, that we're trying to drive the programs that our community needs uh, and cares about, that we're trying to drive the advocacy initiatives that can make the biggest impact in our community and making lives safer every day. So if there are things that you want to see or things that you're interested in getting involved in, we could use your help. Thank you. Thank you. And um, if you sign up for our FAIR mailing list, you'll be able to get updates about our uh, monthly webinars that take place. We'll be sending out details about our June webinar uh, very shortly. But um, we thank you all for joining us today, and um, we hope to see you for our next free monthly webinar. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.